Hey everybody, welcome back to The Deviant Mind. I'm uh, one of your hosts, Dominica Best. And I'm Chris Gordon. And we were just about to launch into a huge discussion about what happened today in the trial of Alex Murdoch. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we have to get this on tape. Today, we're actually doing the episode of O.J. Simpson and Nicole Simpson Brown. And, uh, but hold on, because there's some really big news that came out, which was that Alex Murdoch was found guilty and he was sentenced to two life sentences where the judge actually called him a monster. And Chris was about to get into something he heard. Yes, he, he called him a monster and then, um, he, mentioned that the state uh, had requested not to seek the death penalty. And then he said, uh, it ma- the judge said it made him think for a moment of all the family's history as solicitors, himself included, Alex. Mm-hmm. And then he says, I can't even fathom all the death. I know you guys did death penalties. You sought the death penalties of people that did less than your crime. So it was amazing that he threw that in there, like, hey, the state doesn't want you to get death, but you sought death for a lot of people, yeah, like your family did. Exactly. I was just like, that was pretty powerful. That is really powerful. Wow. Yeah. And I did read somewhere that he said, um, he actually talked back to the judge and said, I'm not a monster. He said, you might not be right now, but when you were on those pills, you were. And I saw some yeah. of the jury coming out and talking, being like, the guy was a liar. The jury took three hours for deliberation, and yeah. they found him guilty. And they said there was only three holdouts, and it only took them like 45 minutes to decide yeah. that he was guilty because he lied. He was just he a lied. constant liar. I think the biggest problem was he got put on that stand. He, uh, and to the defenses this May, they warned him, you know, you really shouldn't take uh the stand he said no i I really i want to and uh that really wow that did him in and also i would like to give uh a shout out to the final prosecutor's closing argument uh for mentioning colombo ah really did he mentioned colombo awesome (laughs) that's great he was like now colombo would show up with some things but through the course of the show, he would figure it out. And that's what we did here. And I was like, Columbo! Oh, my God. I'm telling you, the piece of information that got him these two life sentences was the fact that he said he was at the dog kennels. That yes. was the fact, four minutes before they were shot. He said he was yes. there, that it was him in the video, that the four yeah. witnesses were right. He was there. The chicken yeah. defense did not work because it didn't make any sense. A liar yeah. and he killed his family probably god only knows why i mean yeah only- i was also happy during the closing argument they uh uh prosecutor mentioned that his wife had said boy you know what that snapchat video and you hear the dog bubba barking she was like those were your best witnesses those dogs if only those dogs could talk yeah there you, you know go. and there, there you there go it was. So yeah, so as we said, he was guilty, and guilty he was, and of course, they're going to go through like a whole round of, um, because the judge, I mean, the defense attorney already said that they were going to be putting in a motion for, you know, going through that whole legal thing, which I'm losing the word for right now, but um, when they appeal, so they're going to appeal, appeal, of course, but good luck, good luck with him, because he's still- so here's the thing. So this was just his murder trial. He still has to go through a whole finance yes. trial. And the judge mentioned that because he's going to be on that trial too. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. That's amazing. Amazing. Go judge. Um, all right. So today's episode is a big yeah. one. OJ Simpson, which do you remember where you were when the white Bronco was on the TV? Yes, I was at my friend's house watching the 1994 NBA playoffs between the Knicks and I forget who they were playing. But the game was interrupted, and my friends and I freaked out because it just cut to the white Bronco. And we were like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, Jay's on the run. And we are like, this is like the third quarter. It's the Knicks. <laughs> 
And so what they finally did after a while, they got privy to the notion, oh, we could put it in a small box in the corner. And so ultimately, right. that's where I was. I was on the Upper West Side of Manhattan just watching the basketball game. And then that happened. How about you? Where were you? I was, I believe, in Connecticut. I was home from my first year of college. And ah. I just remember, like, sitting at my parents' house watching something and then just boom. And then they had it for hours. I mean, he... Hours. Um, he just went to all the different freeways and I had never been to Los Angeles at that point. And now having lived here for 20 years, I'm like, of course, he just went through all the freeways. It's I'm just not getting off. And uh, you know, and then, it was, sh go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I was really impressed that bystanders and people on bridges, how quickly they made placards being like, go OJ. You're I know, you know I, I know. Like, wow. And like saving the, save the juice. And we love the juice. And I'm like, this How? is a guy who's running from like butchering his wife. Like, are you joking? Yeah. I was, but I was really impressed how quickly they came up with the signs. Like the guy's okay. driving, he's being okay. chased by police. You look up on the bridge and there are people holding like free, you know, like go OJ. We believe you juice. And I'm just like, do they have markers? Are they walking around with cardboard? Yeah. It's what yeah. a scene. I mean, it really was a disturbing scene. It, it was actually, and it was an, a very disturbing crime. And for some of you who might not be as old as we are, this happened on June 13th, 1994, which yeah. I know sounds like three decades ago, I guess. Um, it's unbelievable. Crazy in and of itself. So um, the people who perished in this crime were his wife, Nicole Brown Simpson. And she was his ex-wife at that point. And um, a guy who, again, this is, seems to be one of those cases of it, at the wrong place at the wrong time. His mm -hmm. name was Ron Goldman. And as we usually do, we are going to start with the victims. And so yeah. first we're going to start with Nicole Brown. She was born on May 19, 1959 in Frankfurt, West Germany, to a German mom, Judith Bauer and her American husband, Louis Brown, who was from Kansas. And he was stationed in West Germany as part of the American Armed Forces publication, Stars and Stripes. So 1959, that's, you know, about that 14 years after World War II, and this yeah. is back in the communist times. So there was a big American pr uh, forces presence in West Germany because East Germany was a thing. So yeah. um, they actually lived in Germany for a while, but they decided to move back to uh, America. While they were mm -hmm. in Germany, Nicole and her sister Denise were born, and they were still under the age of five when the family decided to move back to the United States. And they went to Garden Grove, California, and mm -hmm. that's where the family added two more girls, Dominique and Tanya. When the girls were in high school, they moved to Monarch Beach in the coastal city of Dana Point, which is in Orange County. It's a very, very nice surfing, um, surfing place. And mm -hmm. that's where the girls went to high school. And Nicole was extremely popular. She was bubbly, always happy. And she was crowned homecoming princess at Dana Hills mm -hmm. High School in 1971. And she was ready to go on to bigger and better things after high school. And so after graduation, got a job at a clothing boutique that she only lasted for about a week. And then she got a job at the Daisy Beverly Hills club. And that's where she met OJ. And she only met him a few weeks later and she had just turned 18. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. He was 29 and she did not know who he was and was near the end of his professional football career. I don't know very much about football. So you're going to have to fill in the blanks on this one for me. But I do remember he was already an actor. He had been doing TV and movies for a decade. And he was married to a woman yeah. named Marguerite Whiteley that yeah. had been married for 10 years with her. And they had three kids, Arnell, Jason, and a newborn, Aaron. And as I said before, Nicole had never met him and had never heard of him before that night. So mm. she enrolled in Saddleback College in Mission Viejo in 1977 but she was already dating oj so 
And at that I, time, he was divorced, I believe, from his first he, wife. No, actually, from Did everything I affair? found, seemed like it. Like, they started okay. dating, and then he got divorced. Got um, it. Because, unfortunately, his, uh, his youngest daughter, Erin, she drowned in a pool that... Yeah. Um, that yeah. end of the summer and they were already living oh no you know what i'm actually wrong so you, you know what you might actually be right i'm sorry I'm, this, uh, according, from my according, notes, to, according to my timeline it's 1979 the daughter dies and it's and just too much they get family. divorced well yeah two years later they finally they get divorced yeah yeah and so by this time in 1979 they're already living together so maybe they were separated so I might yeah. not be right in my timeline that they actually had an affair. So that I um I misread. From I apologize. What I understand, from what I understand, I think at one point I don't know if it was prior to her being with OJ, but she, I I think there was word that she had been dating another football player, a friend of his, Marcus Allen. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. I think, but I, you know, I can't I I can't recall that hundred percent. But okay. So but so yeah, I uh I misread so. I know they met when she was 18 yeah. and they said that they started dating soon afterwards, but him and his current wife or his wife at the time might right. have been already separated. Yeah. Um, and so from the quotes that I got from some friends of OJ's and Nicole's that their relationship was very passionate. And this is a direct quote from Kathy Lee Crosby, who is an old friend of OJ's in the LA times that it was a very passionate, a very volatile, and a very obsessive relationship. And that was on both sides. So, um, as we said before, OJ's youngest daughter, Erin, drowned in a swimming pool very tragically. And she was on life support for eight days, and she didn't survive. And that was in August. And Nicole and OJ were already living in a rented house in Beverly Hills at that time. Mm. And so... <laughs> I didn't realize this because again, 94 is so long ago, but there's a whole Kardashian, I know, like angle here where yeah. um, Nicole Brown Simpson was extremely close friends with Kris Jenner and yeah. as was OJ and OJ was there when Khloe Kardashian was born. Yeah. So In fact, I, was he's like, the God oh. I think he was their godfather. Yes, he was the godfather and he was the best man at their wedding. Yeah. And Nicole was there and Nicole was like they were in the same circle of friends uh i've heard yeah. a lot of quotes from chris jenner being like they were pretty much best friends um and they vacationed together and i actually had a quote from chris jenner's book uh, her memoir in 2011 called chris jenner and all things kardashian mm -hmm. said quote the two of them were madly in love and had this obvious chemistry that you could feel when you were in the same room with them they absolutely could not keep their hands off each other. He was already uh -huh. incredibly possessive of Nicole. Even when she would go to the bathroom, OJ would wonder out loud when she was going to come back. <laughs> and so Nicole and OJ were married on February 2nd, 1985, in the backyard of his Rockingham estate. And they had kids pretty... Um, I mean, it took a couple years, but they had... A daughter named Sydney, who was born October 1985, and a son, Justin, mm -hmm. who was born in August 1985. And the couple's friends remember them as being like that fun couple who hosted tons of dinners, get-togethers. There were huge Fourth of July bashes and Easter dinners. They were very close to Nicole's parents and sisters, and all the family would get together often. Mm -hmm. Now, Nicole was also a very present and devoted mother, didn't have nannies and really wanted to take care of her children herself. She took them to dance classes and karate classes. She did all of their birthday parties. And she also started her own interior decorating business. Hmm. Now, that obviously looks like they're having this wonderful life. But unfortunately, the marriage itself was not a good one. It seems that there have been reports that OJ was abusive pretty very early on in the marriage, he was also constantly unfaithful to her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it seemed that, um, and he was extremely possessive. So Nicole didn't really like sharing this part of her life with even her closest friends until mm. she really began fearing for her life. And I read a lot of reports saying that typically she 
would find out that he had cheated on her. And mm-hmm. She was a strong woman, so she would uh, come at him and being like, "How dare you cheat on me?" She would yeah, really stand up for herself, and he would go. Just she said that his eyes would turn black, and it was like he became like right. so his pupils became enlarged, and there was no stopping him. And the first time this spilled out into the public was uh, during their 1989 New Year's Eve party, mm-hmm. where Nicole called 911 at 3:58 a.m. And at first, the operator could only hear screams and would think that someone was hit. And then, when officers finally arrived at Rockingham, Nicole, wearing only sweatpants and a bra, emerged from the bushes and yelled, quote, he's going to kill you. And asked who he was going. And when the police asked who was going to kill her, she said, OJ. Mm-hmm. And they were like, wait, who? And she said, OJ, the, the football player. And according to the police report from that morning, she had a black left eye, a cut lip, and a bruised forehead. And there was a handprint on her neck. And he was actually um, charged. Or, oh, she also said that when this was all going down, she said, you guys never do anything. She was one of the officers. You never yeah. do anything. You come out. You've been here eight times. Yeah. You called the police on him eight times, and you knew never do anything to him. That's so, OJ. And, that's, and so he pleaded no contest to spousal battery. Like, he wasn't, I guess, indicted for this, if that's what it's called. But right. he got kind of a slap on the wrist. Like, yeah. he got a small... um like I think it was like five hundred dollars to pay, and I got to say nervous. that's that's kind of you know when he played football and you have stuff like this, it's it, it sort of let the secret out. You know, uh, domestic violence is pretty common with a lot of footballers, unfortunately, and a lot of sports players in general. And what's kind of weird and almost obvious is these players will get like a brief suspension where they can't play for a month. But then they come back. They still get their salary. It often doesn't go like anything that's happening outside uh, that's personal with the, in regards to domestic violence. is just kind of swept under the rug because, you know, they're gods. They, they got to keep playing. You know, the teams rely on them. They get the advertising. So yeah. for too long, and, and again, I, it's, uh, you know, it's more so in football, uh, they say, because of the terrible head injuries. Because of the head injuries. Right. And uh, you know, and this is back in the '80s, back. where this wasn't even a conversation, right? Absolutely, so, yeah. No one discussed this. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so the other issue, I guess you mm-hmm. could say, was an issue was that Nicole's family was really entangled in many businesses. So her father ran the Hertz rental car franchise in the Gal that OJ owned. Mm-hmm. OJ also paid for her sister Dominique Brown's USC tuition. Um, Nicole's first coven cousin was a gardener on OJ's estate, and then he appointed him as manager to two pioneer chicken locations, which was like a fast food place that he owned. And mm. so it was very difficult for her to all of a sudden get out of this marriage. So she was abused, but then also like her family, I don't want to say it's depending on him, but it's just everything's right. very entangled. And uh, Nicole was very closed off during their marriage. Uh, She didn't really speak to her family or her friends about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And again, this is in the 80s. And yeah, I guess there were some TV movies about spousal abuse, but it just really wasn't in the conversation like it is now. I mean, if it is in the conversation now. In 1988, she got a new white Ferrari from OJ and she told her friends it was OJ's way of saying I'm sorry. And her sister Denise in the trial testified of something she had seen. And this just really grabbed me as like, I just, yeah, again, the 80s. But so okay. she testified she was out to dinner one night with her sister and OJ in 1987. And this is a direct quote from her. OJ grabbed Nicole's crotch and said, this is where babies come from and this belongs to me. And Nicole just sort of wrote it off as it was nothing. Like, you know, like she was used to that kind of treatment and he was like, I thought it was really humiliating. Ask me. And she also recalled another time where he flew in a rage at his estate. So this is another quote from her. Uh, quote, he ran upstairs, got clothes, started flying down the stairs and grabbed Nicole, told her to get out of his house, his house. 
wanted all of us out of his house. Picked mm-hmm. her up, threw her up, threw her against a wall, picked her wow. up again, threw her out of the house. Ended up on her. She ended up falling. She ended up on her elbows and on her butt. We were all sitting there screaming and crying. And then he grabbed me and threw me out of the house. So, I mean, he does this in front of people, you know, he's doing it in front you of kind people. Across that lawn, you know, in the house. Sure. But like once you start doing this sort of thing and behavior in front of others, I then mean, you've lost control. What can, either that what can possibly be happening behind closed doors? The way right. I always think about it, like. Just, I, yeah. I can't imagine how violent he was inside that house. So um, Nicole would sometimes go back to her parents after such big blowups, but he would always call and apologize and get really emotional and she would go back. But right. in 1992, she finally filed for divorce. And yeah. she got a $433,000 settlement and 10 k a month for the children. She moved into a condo in Brentwood and really began enjoying her life. She was taking care of her kids, but she started like being more uh, open and present with her friends. One of the things that I was reading, the friends during her marriage, they said she would tend to cancel plans at the last minute, uh, yeah. was really hesitant to sometimes cancel plans. So I'm thinking like bruises because they, you know, people had bruises or right. people would see bruises on her and would yeah. ask her, but then it was awkward. And so she would kind of try to pull away from them. So she yeah. was very isolated during the marriage. And so when she got a divorce, she started going out. She started going out to dinners with friends again. She was going dancing. However, uh, OJ Simpson would be seen staring at her through her condo windows in the bushes. I, now I, I also read... Uh, testimony said they were hanging out after the divorce. So they actually the, were going. They they went back into a relationship. They, so yeah, it was off and on, on yeah. again, off again. Yeah. So but but he definitely she, kept tabs on her. Like I had heard that too. That he was just kind of, you know, he's he, like staring right as you're about to yeah, say. Yeah. Well, I heard this. I mean, I, I didn't put it on there, but there was uh, because there's a lot of phone calls. Uh, yeah. So he. This, uh, he spoke to her in such an awful way about essentially trying to take the support money away from her children because he had seen her in um, kind of a, a sexual thing happening with some boyfriend through her window. And yes. so he came at her. And so it was, um, it was, seemed very unhealthy. I mean, she, she they did were go back also, to him. Uh, they were also doing cocaine together, from what I understand. By all accounts, they were doing a ton of cocaine, uh, and also, you know, and and we'll get to him in a bit. But Ron Goldman was part of that. Yeah, there was like yeah. this whole thing of going out and partying, doing the drugs, and um, yeah, at that time, uh, by some accounts I heard, she was uh, sometimes dating friends of his. But the thing is, uh, he was also dating. Like they were both well, kind of doing their own thing. Right. I mean, he, well, he, I think the, I believe what I wrote, uh, one of the things that precipitated the divorce was that he was having a, a very torrid affair with Tawny Katane. Remember yes. the girl on the, on the white Jaguar from, yes. from the, the hair videos? Um, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I guess this is the eighties. So it's yeah. very excess, big hair, Los Angeles, lots of coke, yeah. but um but in any case, she was getting more and more scared. And so yeah. she finally broke it off in late spring, 1994. And at that point, she told her mother, quote, I'm scared. I go to the gas station. He's there. I'm driving and he's behind me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it was, yeah. he was stalking her. Exactly. He was stalking yeah. her as, and he, I mean, she had said like, we shouldn't do this anymore. And I don't know what kind of arrangement he had to see his children because the children were very young at this point and they were living yes. with her. But there was, and I, I know the night that this all happened, he actually decided he was not going to go to the dance recital of their daughter. He um, was there though. No, he said he wouldn't go. Oh, really? I maybe, heard that he went and then like left right after. Maybe that's what, and he didn't join them for dinner. So maybe I'm getting that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. He had nothing um, to do with dinner, but he was there. I mean, but, but he was, from what I understand, I mean, there were, you mentioned earlier, there were, but they were actually both good parents, from what I understand. 
like she obviously was very devoted and there and present mm-hmm. with uh, her kids, their kids. Uh, it's interesting to note that their uh, both his first wife uh, and and Nicole's uh, divorce, the settlements of the money that mm-hmm. they would receive from OJ and the child support are very similar. Like it's oh, so it happens to him twice. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's the that's... same. Same for both. Is it the same? Oh, that that isn't that is fascinating. Um, I so I did find something about Ron Goldman too, and who he mm-hmm. was. He was a uh, restaurant waiter and friend of Nicole, uh, who was doing a kind gesture that night of bringing her mother's glasses to her. They had had dinner at Mezzaluna, and this was where Ron was working at the time. And he offered to bring the glasses to her house on his way to a party. So Mm -hmm. again, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, it seems like. He was born on July 2nd, 1968, to Sharon Rufo and Frederick Goldman. He was raised in Buffalo Grove, Illinois, near Chicago. His parents divorced in 1974, and he was brought up with his father, Frederick. He started college at Illinois State University, and he was there for one semester, but when his family decided to relocate to Los Angeles, he followed them. He enrolled in Pierce College. He was very athletic, learned to surf, play beach volleyball, rollerblade, and enjoyed the LA nightlife. A lot. He worked various jobs, including being a tennis instructor and an employment recruiter. And he occasionally worked as a model for Barry Zells. And really his dream, all of his friends said, was to open his own restaurant or bar in the Brentwood area. And he was also a club promoter at several clubs, yeah. which I think is where the cocaine um, connection came in. But it was interesting because when I was doing all of my research, nobody mentioned cocaine. And I did a lot of research with like the family and friends. and Nobody mentioned that at all. Yeah, um, which- I, I, I think a lot of that was was left out but it certainly seems uh that in the back of that restaurant that there was they did there were like coke things happening like oh is that right in, in the back of mezzaluna oh yeah. i see okay okay um, and yeah i think you got we got to also understand that like if they're all doing blow and they're going crazy i mean that can make it could make people rageful uh that, that, i'm absolutely. not excusing anything but like you know ron was also big into karate like this guy was like in good shape. Mm-hmm. He knew what was going on. And, you know, I, all, all I'm saying is that people get pretty crazy. Yeah, you know? oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so he also had, uh, Ron also had aspirations to act and be on a show. And he appeared on a, as a contestant on the short-lived game show Studs in 1992. <laughs> uh, he right. had dated Jackie Bell for nearly two years before she broke off their relationship three months yeah. before his death. And according to an LA Times article published three days after his death, it said that Goldman met Brown only six weeks prior to June 12th. And um, he had borrowed her Ferrari and they were growing increasingly friendly and they were meeting for coffee and dinner, but it was completely platonic. Uh, All of their friends said that it was just, they were just friends. They enjoyed hanging out together. Mm. And um, when he did borrow her white Ferrari, which, as you remember, was the white Ferrari she was given for probably being beat up. Right. Um, he said, yeah, this is just um, a, a f- car I'm borrowing from a friend. So then now so we can get to what happened on the night of June 12th, 1994, which was, as we were saying before, uh, Nicole Brown. Uh, her child had a dance recital. And so that was at 6.30 p.m. The recital ended and she went to dinner with friends and family at Mezzaluna, where Goldman worked as a waiter. Uh, Nicole's mother, she accidentally left her eyeglasses at the restaurant and Goldman volunteered um, to bring it home. So supposedly at 8 p.m., and this is the sequence of events from the trial, was that at mm-hmm. 8 p.m., um, Nicole Brown and her children left Mazaluna and stopped for ice cream on the way home. At 9.15, one of Nicole Brown Simpson's sisters called Mazaluna to say that Nicole's mother had left her glasses, and this is when Ronald Goldman volunteered to return the glasses. Between 9 p.m. and 9.30 p.m., Brian Kalin, a friend staying in a guest house at O.J. Simpson's home, and Simpson went to McDonald's for dinner. 
At 9.45 p.m., Kalen and Simpson returned home. 9.48 mm-hmm. p.m. to 9.50 p.m., Goldman left the restaurant with a white envelope containing glasses. At 10.15 p.m., while watching television, Pablo Feneves, a neighbor of Nicole Brown Simpson, heard cries and the constant barking of a dog. Now, mind you, the children are now sleeping in the condo upstairs. At 10.25 p.m., the limousine driver, Alan Park, arrived at Odell's home. At 10.40 p.m., Kaylin heard three loud thumps on the outside wall of his room. Now, he was staying in a guest room at the Rockingham estate that OJ was living in. So are we thinking that he climbed out his window? by hearing that or was climbing back in to get into the house because by this time by all accounts both uh nicole brown simpson and ronald goldman are dead uh 10 40 to 10 50 p.m park this is the uh limousine driver he buzzes the yeah. intercom several times but does not get any response at 10 55 park calls his boss and tells him simpson is not home he is told to wait until 11 15 since simpson is always late Shortly before 11 p.m., Park sees a black man, six feet, 200 pounds, walking across the driveway towards the house. And about 11 p.m., Kaylin goes to the front of the house to check on the noise, sees the limousine driver at the gate, and several seconds later, Park again buzzes the intercom and Simpson answers. He says he had overslept and just gotten out of the shower. So at 11 p.m., 11.15 p.m., Simpson puts his bags in the limousine. At 11.15 p.m., the limousine leaves for Los Angeles Airport. So this is now OJ's timeline. At 11.35, the limousine arrives at the airport. At 11.45, Simpson leaves on an American Airlines flight to Chicago. At 12.10 a.m., the bodies of Nicole Brown, Simpson, and Ronald Goldman are discovered outside of her townhouse, and they're, like, right inside the gate that was leading to the townhouse. And, uh... At, um, I'm going to say there was a, a, the dog, their dog was, or her dog, which was a white Akita was mm-hmm. found outside of, um, kind of the gate. Yeah. And their neighbors are like, oh, it's this dog, like, wh- why is he out here? And he had blood on his paws. And so yeah. because they knew it was Nicole's dog. They brought her, they brought the dog back, and that's where yeah. they found the bodies. Now, mind you, the when the police came, and the police arrived at 5 a.m., which, again, that's like four hours of when they were, like, the body. I always find this interesting. It's like, so their bodies are found at midnight, but then the police arrive at 5 a.m. Yeah. What's, what's that about? Um, so they had to essentially get the kids to go out in a different way so they wouldn't see the bodies. Yeah. And um, so... So when he comes back, they basically fly right over to him and ask him if they'll come, if he'll come in for questioning, from what I understand, right? Yes, Isn't well, that- because... So, so well, but there was something uh, before then. So essentially, um, they... So detectives Mark Furman and Philip Benatter arrived at uh, O.J. Simpson's house. Oh, they arrived at his house. So they were like, okay, who did it? Probably the husband. So they go to his house and they uh, examined an apparent bloodstain on Simpson's Ford Bronco. Yeah. So at 5.40 a.m., Detective Furman decided to jump the wall in order for police to get inside the estate. Once on the grounds, the detectives woke Simpson's daughter, Arnell, who was staying in the guest house, and she took the police to the house and telephoned Kathy Randa, her father's longtime assistant. And by 7 a.m., Detective Venader declared the area a crime scene and got a search warrant to search the house, which is Mm -hmm. where um, they found the socks. They well, they found the gloves. Oh. It was uh, because the whole. Well, they found the left glove at, at Nicole's. At Nicole's, and they found the other glove. The other glove, right? Okay. Right. So that was, um, and so they called him, and, um, 
add my Like and then and then I feel like he just shows up. Well, and he was like, "Hey guys, called, I was just." Well, they called just, him, uh, and he turned around from Chicago, and yeah. flew back. Um, flew back home, and so right because that was the first time we heard about it. Exactly. So he went supposedly straight to the um, oh, uh, straight to the. Where am I? Okay, so I have a timeline. I will cut all this out because I'm like, but, but, where, where did it just everything go? Um, <laughs> where did I find no, it? It's a crazy. Um, it's a crazy. It's not only crime scene, but the whole timeline. It's yeah. It's just all okay. So place. I'm back to my timeline. So um, at 4:15 a.m., Simpson checked into a hotel in Chicago, and so he was already in Chicago at 4 a.m. as they're going soon to his house. And so yeah. the police went to his Rockingham mansion to inform him of uh, Nicole's death at 4.30, but instead yeah. discovered his bloodstained Bronco and a bloody glove that matched one found near Ron Goldman's body. And so then they got the search warrant by 10.45 a.m. And when they searched Simpson's mansion, they found even more blood traces on the property, including the Bronco. So he... Uh, actually came back to Los Angeles and he was back in Los Angeles at noon uh, where he was informed of Brown's death. And he, the moment he got to his mansion, he was handcuffed and taken to the police station where he was questioned for hours. Yeah. So that was kind of the timeline of the death that I kind of got a little confused there in the middle. Sorry, everybody. Um, but by, so this was all June 13th and 14th by June 15th, Robert Shapiro had become OJ Simpson's attorney, which, mm -hmm. um, he is quite a well-known, uh, yeah. attorney. And, uh, June 16th was when Nicole and Ron's, uh, funerals were held and so he was let out of jail to go to Rolls, yeah, and he was supposed to go back to be properly processed, right? And that's where we got the Bronco chase. Yeah, so he uh, he promised that he would surrender to the cops, but he decided to flee and became a fugitive. And so he was on the freeway driving his white Bronco with his friend Al Cowlings in the driver's seat. And as we talked about before, fans lined up on the freeways to cheer him. Yeah. Helicopters followed. An estimated 95 million people watched the 60 mile pursuit on TV, which, and as you said before, interrupted the broadcast. He's got a gun to his head. He's got a gun to his head. Yes, right? and he, he held a yeah. gun to his head. But yeah. he finally surrendered at his house a little bit before 9 p.m. And he was yeah. arrested and then thrown into jail without bail. Yeah. And as most people can believe, he pleaded not guilty. Yeah. Because crime and he said quote absolutely a hundred percent not guilty to the merger charges and judge lance ito was assigned to the case and again for people of our age we remember all of these names and i'm sure if you guys watch the yes. mini series that was created by um oj was it called um uh the one like won a bunch of I'm, I'm now i'm blanking on his name the guy who does uh ryan ryan murphy's ryan murphy yeah so he did yeah. this was this was called the trial of the century yeah and um so they uh the prosecution decided not to pursue the death penalty and they instead wanted to uh seek life without parole and um the trial started on, I believe, well, the jury went on duty on January 11th, 1995. And then yeah. uh, O.J. Simpson had new lawyers because the lawyers he had stopped speaking to each other. And yeah. then on January 18th, 1995, Johnny Cochran, he took the reins of the defense and said, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and... Again, their biggest thing of this trial was the Bronco and the gloves. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and yeah, the, the allegations trial, of abuse. 
trial itself, eight months, eight months. And then when you read the accounts from those jury members nowadays or back then, they it, they said it was absolutely excruciating. You can't yeah. talk to your family about it. You can't talk about it. And you're put up in a hotel. So they were right. Yeah, because they were pressured. Yeah. Yeah. They're all yeah. literally literally in hotels for eight for in the hotel for eight months. Uh and then Yeah, and there and was oh go ahead. I was just gonna say, and once again, here here is yet another case where race gets involved, right? Because then there's this whole great divide in our society. Um, you know, and when the verdict uh came out, I mean, it, you see uh there's footage of African American communities in LA just freaking out and around, you know, basically around the country, just like, yes. And then, then when you cut to a bunch of white people watching it, uh, they're just kind of head in hands and they're like, no, like, uh, so it definitely became this whole race thing. I well, feel. And then on top, like, you know, detective Mark Furman was cross-examined and denied he was racist, but then there was, um, he was on tape being racist, right? So this is again in the nineties. So yeah. this was before the LAPD had their big corruption, uh, big corruption. And there was also he supposedly tampered with evidence. And Dennis yeah. Fong, uh, who is a criminologist, he admitted that proper protocols were not entirely enforced at the scene of the crime. Right. He also, uh, Furman uh, took the fifth when asked about if he had ever participated in any sort of cover-ups or planting of evidence. He took the fit. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, of course, because LAPD in the 90s. Wow. Um, <laughs> right? Um, but there was, I mean, there was DNA evidence that put him at the scene. There was a drop of blood. There was a, in the, the jurors learned that there was a one in 170 million people would have the genetic characteristics of a drop of blood that discovered at the crime scene. So it sounded like Which I believe was a B type B something B. like some weird, so but also of... the, uh, the uh, blood was collected by a detective eight ounces. Mm -hmm. And then when it was in the lab, it was actually six ounces. Oh, so that was another big thing that they wanted to bring in. Where where is this two ounces of OJ blood? And so then, then mm -hmm. I, I, and then they found that uh, there was what they call EDTA on the socks, uh, mm -hmm. and apparently with the, socks? the socks with the socks, the blood okay. is on the outside of the socks, but not on the inside. I see. Or some, I or or perhaps vice versa. In other words, it wouldn't make sense for where the blood was. I and see. there's this chemical they use EDTA, which helps um, like coagulate blood. So then they can mm -hmm. transfer it over to lab and see what's going on. So they found that um, in both in the car and on his socks. So that I was see. a big question that uh, the defense, defense came up with was how did EDTA get into these socks? Where are the two ounces of OJ blood? I see. So they're thinking that that evidence was planted because he already had a history of beating the crap out of her. Right. And they were like, okay, we got our guy, so we're going to just plant this blood. Yes. They there. said the whole time there was never any other suspect. They just had to zero in. On OJ, they have proof of the 911 calls. He's an abusive man. It's kind of dangerous. He's like a big guy. And you got him. Like, it can't be anyone else. You know, I mean, we've seen these cases. I mean, look, all signs definitely point to his his having something to do with this. But so sell me on your theory of, of, of who you think who did it. You got it. Uh, so some other things to point out, when they show up at the crime scene at 5 in the morning... Tons of detectives and cops are walking around, walking around the blood, leaving footprints. The coroner, the coroner is seen leaning up against a railing with his foot in the blood. People are walking up the stairs, going through the blood. Uh, the defense's uh, forensic expert said he had never seen a more contaminated crime scene in all of his years of experience. My goodness. They also said it's the coroner's, respo coroner's responsibility to examine the bodies. No one else's. 
yeah, right. other cops were motioning the heads, trying and touching uh, things. There was um, DNA on Ron Goldman's shirt uh, that was never tested, which is pretty odd. Oh, that is very odd. There yeah. was, at the scene of the crime, in addition to the glove, there was a hat, like a beanie cap. And the fence wanted to mention that. Why didn't you guys, men, why does an L LAPD or these detectives mention this hat? And they dismissed it. It was omitted from uh, the trial for some reason. They weren't allowed to use it. Uh, 36 hours after the crime scene, it was washed down. Wow. They okay. hosed everything. And what's interesting is they hose everything. They hose all the, all, all the blood. The bodies are gone. Everything is gone except, oddly enough, on the gate, a drop of OJ's blood, which, again, they say may have been contaminated with that, you know, the EDTA. That, yeah. Or it could have been taken from this two ounces they have, but it's a speck of blood on the gate after they wash down the whole scene. Yeah, that's that's I mean, I suppose that could happen, but that's also pretty suspect. Yes. Um, so much so, so No, good. So I'm like, well, that makes sense why he was cuz, you know, this is the if everybody knows, he was actually acquitted of this. He was found not guilty on uh October 3rd, 1995. He was acquitted and there the jury deliberated for less than for hours, which yeah. meant that the prosecution's case essentially fell apart because probably of all of this evidence tampering that we about. So why do you think because when we spoke, yeah. you had mentioned that you thought that the son did it. Why did you think the son did it? So I was looking into uh Jason Simpson, uh who was uh or is rather OJ's son. Uh, from his first marriage. Uh, and then in my uh, looking around, I found that there's this other theory that it could have been uh, mafia related. Because in, in, in 94, th it's kind of like the end of the mafia. And what happens is the mafia and La Costa Nostra, they start focusing on drugs. Like it's no longer about territory or anything like this. It's all about drugs. And there's this funny character named Charlie... Elric, who's a, 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 cl a very close friend of OJ's, uh, he knew Nicole, he actually knew Ron Goldman, because he was uh, known for being a big-time drug trafficker. Ah. Well, a lot of the cocaine that this, you know, this group and their friends were buying from, it usually came from this guy. Um, and it, it, one theory is that night... He OJ's about to do whatever it takes to go to uh, get the airplane, but then they show up. That Charlie Ulrich and a couple of his associates show up, and they're like, "You owe us a hundred thousand dollars. What's going on?" And so OJ's freaking out. He's like, "It's not. It's not just all me. Like it's Nicole too." And they're like, "Well, we better do something." So this one theory has it that he wanted to go over there and read her the riot act and intimidate the hell out of her. And they would join him in the intimidation. Uh, the theory has it they all go. There was never intention to kill, but just to threaten her. And that she was like, you know, go fly a kite. Uh, OJ got pissed. And then they started doing stuff. And then he joined in. And I then see. Ron Goldman shows up. And then he's just collateral damage because he's there. Um, I mean, she was almost from... She was almost decapitated from the left side, which is interesting. And then, uh, at the when they take when they book OJ, uh, you remember he had a cut on his finger. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but that was it. And the idea being that if it were OJ battling Ron Goldman, who who had the fence wounds, right? His knuckles were all bloody. Uh, he was in a fight. He's a karate expert. Right. Uh, the idea is that uh, why didn't OJ have more bruises? Why was it just that little cut on his finger? Right, right. And then so, they like, said didn't. that the cut on his finger 
they thought might have been consistent with her nails. That, like, when he was touching her, she dug her nails into him. Uh, but then that was somehow uh, proven wrong because of, like, the nail size and the cut. But at the same time, he couldn't really... He Three times he changes his story as to how his finger got cut. Right. So... So what happens is like you keep there are like these theories, but there's like stuff that may be true. So if we follow the mafia idea, they go over there. It's a botch job. Uh, Charlie Ulrich says, you get back. I got this. Takes his Bronco, wraps up everyone's clothing, puts it in a bag, disposes of it. Uh, rumor has it that it was all burned, uh, but it was sloppy and it was a big rush and OJ gets home. And apparently he's like naked running through people's yards because his clothes are gone. And he smacks Cato, uh, Cato's wall three times or whatever to indicate like, come help or like, I'm here. Uh, I see. And uh, apparently on the stand, uh, Cato is completely lying. You know, he says uh, he, he's afraid. So he just wants to keep away. And apparently Got the it. word is these guys are like, you know, too much, like just leave town for a bit. Got you know, it. like after you testify, just leave town. Um, so now, was his son Jason involved with the mafia crew? So, no. So that's just the one theory which I I actually don't believe. I I I I believe the notion that OJ and Nicole perhaps owed a lot of money in 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 coke, and uh, incidentally, okay, two crazy things: Charlie Urick, right? Uh, traffic, drug, mafia related, blah, blah, blah. He was also co-conspirator later after the silver case. Me- uh, OJ robbed a sports memorabilia store. Uh, it was an armed robbery in Las Vegas. Yes. Charlie Irvick was there with him. He was an accomplice. Oh, so he had like- time for that. Oh, wow. Okay, so there is actually credence to this story then. Okay, okay. And that's why people think maybe they work together. Maybe they're helping one another out. The other thing is, in OJ's crazy book, If I Did It, <laughs> he has what he calls an imaginary character. If I did it, let's say I did it with a person named Charlie. It's in Got the it. book. He names a hypothetical accomplice named Charlie. Named Charlie. Okay, so then theoretically, Charlie could have all the knuckle bruising and, well, because typically if you stab people, you tend to hurt yourself because right. the, um, cause the the knife gets very slippery and so yes. slip, right? And right. I mean, granted, there was gloves and so some people right. thought that he had gloves, but well, that is actually, did they, because I saw a picture of him in the, in the, uh, at the trial and he tried on those gloves and said, Oh, they're too tight. I would never wear them. Right. Was the prosecution story that whoever killed them was wearing the gloves while they were stabbing them. I think it was more so we don't know whose gloves these are. We don't know how these got here. It wasn't, it, they've kind of veered away from this is what it was definitively. They were just kind mm-hmm. of like, what is this? Oh, and so I it's like, that- well, they were, they were both in the planted. same place. Like one was at the crime scene, one was in Rockingham's house. So that's making the right. connection to OJ. And I think it also was their way of saying, why didn't you interview anyone else? Like, why weren't there any other suspects? They could have easily. Here's the other thing. Take the Bronco. You have a search warrant for the house. The Bronco's outside. Take the Bronco. They, they waited on that, which is really weird. Um, and then, uh, they never speak with this Charlie guy. And right. so all that's kind of up in the air, and I guess it's viable. But if you ask me, OJ was definitely there, but it was his son, Jason, who actually did the killings. And here are some crazy things that lead me to believe. A lot of this comes from an investigator, investigator uh, Deer. This fella mm-hmm. has been, as soon as the trial ended, he said something's just not right. Because his whole mm-hmm. thing was, if he's innocent, then who the hell did this? So that's been right. his whole thing. Right. So Jason uh, is born, let's see, he's he's born in 1970. He's 52 years old now, right? He, um, he incidentally, during the car chase, the Bronco chase, 
he's the first one that comes out of the house and convinces his father to come out of the car. Oh. When you watch that footage, the aerial view from the helicopter, he's the first one out, and you see him, oh, like, yelling. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. I do remember that. And then that. he gets out. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's born in 1970. Uh, he's, he's got a, an older sister, and Aaron is the younger sister who dr- uh, drowns tragically. So he's about seven years old, six years old, when his sister drowns. Mm-hmm. Traumatic, right? Absolutely. He's eight, nine years old when his parents split up. Also traumatic. So he's just going through all this weird stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That's really affecting him. Um, he starts trying to get into football. Uh, but at the end of the day, there were all these weird things about him as he gets older. He becomes a sous chef, which is fine in itself. You could, anyone can be uh, a sous chef. But he had a lot of mental issues. He, he suffered from mental health issues uh, dating back to when he was a kid. Uh, apparently, by the age of 14, he was heavily into drugs. So at 14, he's already kind of messing himself up, probably to cover, you know, all his pain that he suffered. Also, he's kind of, you know, it's like your father is OJ. So like everywhere he goes, it's like this whole crazy thing. He feels like the pressure to also have to get into uh, into football, and he tries is unsuccessful, decides to become a sous chef. Now, here's all the crazy stuff. He was never interviewed. He, they, the hat they found, the beanie hat, was later seen on, worn by Jason in a photograph. The same hat. After oh. the murders, there are photos of him wearing the same hat, but now it's gray, so it's no longer black but he's still wearing the same hat. Uh, And if you hold on a second, because really, it's just absolutely crazy. He's, uh, oh, where's this damn thing? Wait, I could tell you this other thing. Uh, The thing with these, uh, Jason was on parole at the time of the killings uh, for threatening his girlfriend at knife point. Oh, yikes. as As a sous chef, he was known to carry his knives with him. He had a knife kit. He's a big guy. Yeah. He, he was also, uh, he stuck up, he, he was arguing with his boss about hours, uh, the head chef or something like this, and it came to a point where he pulled a knife on him and said, like, you better, get, you better change my hours or whatever, and the guy got completely right. freaked out. I don't know if he ever pressed charges with that. Um, so he's been, he had been diagnosed with uh, Jekyll and Hyde disease, uh, which is also known as intermittent rage disorder, and uh, was prescribed a heavy, heavy uh, medication, uh, which OJ paid for over, the, over time. Uh, two months prior to the killings, he stops taking the medicine. Oh, no. He also okay. checked himself into a hospital claiming I'm about to have, I have a lot of rage. So he's committed uh, for a while to a psych, the psychiatric, psychiatric uh, institution out here in, uh, in LA. And then um, this investigator found out that there was a storage unit that was, you know, when you don't pay your rent after a while for your storage unit, it's up for auction. Mm-hmm. So this guy uh, bought Jason's storage so that's how this investigator Deer was able to uncover all these things. He had three handwritten diaries in uh, in the storage, and man, I gotta tell you, I I gotta find this thing because he says outrageous things. Um, yeah, he he talks about. Hold on a now, second. There, and there were no witnesses seeing anybody at the near the town home time of the murders i didn't see it um, yeah so uh well so the, the idea is that he was also uh combat trained he um he knew how to use military? knives he had knives and so i feel like when he had the he had this battle with ron goldman uh right and then a lot of people feel that 
he may have been killed first. Some people feel that maybe Ron Goldman, and then they went into the house. Uh, so he's a pretty fit guy. So the gate's locked. The idea is that Jason could hop over, uh, get in there and do all this stuff, right? Like he's waiting in the bushes or something like that, and here's him coming. Um, but uh, he um, got rageful the night. He was really full of rage the night uh, of Sydney's performance because Nicole oh, – okay, to back up, he and Nicole had a yeah. really close relationship, really close. Okay. In fact, they danced together. They did drugs together. They kind of partied. She was oh, always whoa. like, let's go out. And then he would go out. Right. Uh, so they were really close. After uh, Sydney's performance, the, you know, they were all going to go eat at this place. But the plan was to go to Jason's restaurant. But she didn't call. So he calls her and says, what, what's going on? Uh, oh. And she says, oh, you know, we're, we're just not going to come. You know, we're going to some other place or something like this. And then because of that, according to the place where he works, if you don't get anything, uh, any patrons after a certain time, you close. Like, it's just okay. closed. So you don't, there's no work. He has, uh, they have there a time card. You, you punch mm -hmm. in, you punch out. He punches out around the, the 9 o'clock crime scene time, like 20 yeah. minutes before. People saw him leave. But he goes back or something happens. It's he, he handwrites. He handwrites the time and the date and everything uh, for that time he leaves instead of punching it. Oh, I see. So then theoretically, then that could have been any time he left. It could have been any time. Now, was his the restaurant he was working at? Was it in Brentwood as well? I'm sorry? Was the restaurant he was working at in Brentwood as well? Do you know? Like, was it close to the crime scene? Uh, that I'm not too sure about. I don't know where it was in relation. Uh, but this guy has a history of talking to himself and talking about his demons in his diaries. Uh, so what would you think the motive for that would be? Just like the fact that he had so much rage and then he didn't show up that night to the restaurant? And 100%. that triggered him off? A hundred percent. I think he was really relying on them to come. Because of that, there's you know there's no real business happening in the restaurant. It's dead. But really, it was it was a blow. It was a blow to him. And the fact that he's not taking his meds for the past two months, uh, I mean, you know, any little thing could set him off. And that's what his former uh, girlfriend said. That's what people who went to school with him said. Nice guy, but it was Jekyll and Hyde. It, I mean, that's the name of this disease where yeah. he, he literally goes zero to 90 and you don't know when it's going to happen. You know, again, right. he checks himself into this institution. He tried to commit suicide three times. He, wow. you know, threatens his girlfriend's life that puts him on parole, threatens his boss's life. I think all of a sudden here's someone who's really close to him saying, you know, sorry, we're not going to come over, but something as small as that is in that state of mind is enough yeah, to set him off. Yeah, it could just totally set him off. Okay, so all what right. I think I can... is, so my theory is that he goes there. Um, you know, again, the DNA on Ron Goldman's shirt, never tested. Never tested. Is that his? Uh, the other question is, that's his hat. Why did we leave that out? Why couldn't that be brought to trial? He, um, I feel, called his father in a panic and being like, you got to help me. Um, when the verdict now, is read, he's his... not... Were, were him and his father close? Very close. Very close. So he's very close to his father. I mean, I think obviously growing up he had issues, but then they became very close. And at the verdict reading, and he's not guilty, they cut, the footage of Jason is, he's so flood. You could tell he has so much guilt. He's just crying so hard. And his hands are his hands are in his head, and he's just kind of like it, it. Almost feels like, oh my god, thank God, because my dad's covering for me. Now I, I feel I feel OJ was there. Like that is, that is his blood. It's you can't yeah. plant like all that blood and right. mixed in with a lot of stuff. But I feel he was there. Didn't know what to do. Freaked out. 
maybe left whatever he on, right? And just jet. And it's like, I'm getting in the limo. Like, fuck this. Like, I'm just, yeah, I can't, um, I can't um, well, do that. Well, at that point, this. he, well, because at that point, he also needs a alibi, right? So if he's in a limo Absolutely. going to the airport and going to Chicago, then he wasn't there. So right. he's out and he knows that he's already been arrested for spousal abuse and everybody knows he's been hitting her. So of yeah. course he's going to be the number one suspect. So that to me almost feels like he was trying to create an alibi for himself for whatever. To protect his son. And yeah. Uh, yeah. here's the kicker. Also in the storage unit that the detective got bought from the auction winner. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a knife in there. Oh. There's a Did knife have, in there. So was there any, obviously, any evidence of blood or anything never on tested. it? Or just fully wiped? Never, they never refused, tested. They refused to test it. He, this guy and others have really been pushing to reopen this trial to get the other, because if he's innocent, their whole thing is, let's get the person who did let's it. Get the, right, exactly. exactly. We Two think people are might dead, have been Jason. Horribly. You never yeah. interviewed him. You never even suspected him, despite he was on parole, despite he right. had rage issues. Um, and they shut it down every time. They, they, because they don't want to bring this back up. It's already a right. big wound. Let's be done with it. He's not and guilty. what we didn't mention was that um, the O.J. Simpson was found liable for the wrongful deaths at the conclusion of a civil trial. That's right. And that was in February of 1997. And he was ordered to pay $8.5 million in compensatory damages to the Goldmans, as yes. well as $25 million in punitive damages to be split between the Goldmans and the Browns' children. Yes. Um, so he lost in a civil case, um, but which probably might be another reason why they don't really want to open up this trial, right? I mean, I don't know if there would be any um, Absolutely. blowback to the civil trial at that point. Right. Um, and obviously, as you said, like I always thought he did it because any man who abuses his wife so incredibly, he's going to be the number one suspect. I mean, 99% out of, 99 of the time they did it because you've already had your, you know, hands yeah. around your wife's neck and uh, it it happens, the crap out of her. It happens way too much. It should never happen, but it does. And then also the, the behavior of following and stalking like that alone is yeah. just intrusive and, and, and just terrible. So yeah, you see these years of violence. It's interesting to know that that behavior and abuse apparently didn't occur during his first marriage. No, that's, I read that too, that there was none of that. And that was why some of the friends were like it, like the, their relationship was very, I mean, it sounds very unhealthy, yeah. But well, obviously, but um, but they said that it was on both sides. It was obsessive and um, kind of all in. And uh, I mean, which I find interesting because if he was all in and so obsessive, why was he having sex with like everybody who came around? Like he had multiple affairs. Like it wasn't yes. just Tawny Katane. It was just you know, a girl of the girl of the month. Right. Um, which I but maybe that's because I'm a woman. I just don't understand. Well, you know, he also could have been pissed with her for being like, hey, why are you cheating on me? And then boom, you know, right. I mean, I mean, there's so many. And there is the, you know, there is the thing of which we now know so much of is football players and their head injuries and yeah. how when they have that specific disease, they lose control very, very yeah. easily. And there's been so many documented cases. Yeah. And this happened in the 80s and 90s. And that was just on nobody's radar. And he had played football for how many years professionally? Yeah, a while. Really long yeah. career. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a lot at of that point, you're like, to your head. You know, and then uh, so the other thing is a lot of folks uh, say that Jason was absolutely obsessed with Nicole, mostly from going out to nightclubs with her. Um, oh. So I think that, uh, you know, I there was like some. You know, there, I there's feel, something there's something, something there. there. And what is do you know what Jason's doing right now? So he basically after the trial moved to Florida and we have no clue where he is. He's kept completely huh. under the radar. He's like off the grid. And the same with his mom, uh, the first wife. She wants she's fully yeah. off the grid. 
but she did offer, and I'm not, I can't remember if she did or not, but she did offer, offer to testify as a character witness to OJ being a good person. I see. So well, I because forget. I mean, if she's like, well, I didn't see this, so I could understand if the defense wanted to use her for that. Um, it's, it's again, a crazy case. Please don't sue us. This is just our opinions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> small podcast. Yeah, do um, not, please. Uh, but at yeah. the same time, you know, I was, I didn't follow the trial closely because I was in architecture school at the time. So I was, so I don't think I had anywhere, a TV anywhere near me um, at this time. Yeah. But I, you know, I had always assumed, as I said before, that he was guilty. And so when we were talking about what case we were going to do next, and I had mentioned Alex Murdoch's trial in conjunction, in conjunction with OJ Simpson's trial, which OJ Simpson's trial was the trial of the century. Yeah. Um, and you had told me about like, well, I think actually his son did it. I was like, well, well, what? Like I had no idea about any of this. So thank you so much for sharing and putting yes. some doubt into my mind of who might actually have killed Ron. Can I, can I throw out another, a few things? And again, this is all conjecture. This is all theory. Absolutely. Like these are just our wacky opinions and things like this. And you know, I definitely feel, I feel OJ's guilty in something, but I, I, I just feel like he's an accomplice. I don't know. Well, who knows? He had the ability to abuse her and put black eyes on her for so long, but he, uh, so Jason, it was actually, okay. So at 14, alcohol, ecstasy, and cocaine, uh, to deal with the loss of his sister, to deal yeah. with the divorce. Right. And police reports, said he was arrested at least four times in uh, at that time, DUI, driving with suspended license, assault with a deadly weapon. Oh, right? okay. Yeah. Uh, a note titled Dear Jason, uh, written to himself, reads, Dear Jason, there are three of us here that I know about. I want solace. Work with solace. Now I am a failure. I cannot do anything right. I cannot learn from it all. I cannot remember alcohol alcohol is the root of all my shortcomings and then in another entry he says this is the year of the knife in 1994 he made an entry saying this is the year of the knife he heard voices in early 1994 okay. um he nearly killed his girlfriend another girlfriend with a knife uh and i mean like father that's like something gun. To, yeah well that's something to be said because OJ, from everything that I've read, had no problems using his fists. He was very yeah. physical. He threw her around. But that was his weapon of choice, was his body. Now, it, there is something to be said for, for was it Jason? Jason is yeah. knives. So did he, when he went after his um, girlfriends, did he go with knives after their girl after them? Yes. Yeah. He to held see them at that, point. So then all of a sudden that actually makes more sense because if you look at, um, you know, crime, people like the weapon of choice is a big deal when you're trying to figure out who did it. And I could imagine, you know, from the things that I read, Nicole had a lot of strangulation, like fingers on her neck. Yes. So if Nicole had been pretend maybe strangled, then that would make sense. But then also because she was almost decapitated, like was she strangled first and then was cut. strangled like, and probably it, like I my guess is like she strangled. Uh, there was also like this uh, major dent and cut on the top of her skull, which mm -hmm. may have been the top but uh, the bottom rather the butt of the knife. Oh, so I think my guess is she strangled. She gets out of it. She's like, and then it's like we just got. I gotta use a knife. Yeah, whoever it is. So uh, it could potentially the still be. I was just going to say the murders take place between 9.45 and 10.05, roughly, right? Yeah. Uh, Jason claimed that he was by himself at around 9.50 and has no alibi. Yeah. I, I, um, I, it's just like these, you know. Which I guess makes sense why, again, like, there was just not enough evidence. Um to find him guilty. I feel that there was perhaps evidence, but they, they really didn't present it in a good way. And it just well, really was absolutely mishandled. 
with and all there the were tempering. a lot of things they could have done better. Right. And then also, if they had brought, like, the defense had brought in the sun, which would be horrifying to bring the sun under, you know, and granted, the defense won. So I guess in a way, they didn't have to do this. They didn't but, have to. Um, at the same time, that it definitely, you've given me a lot to think about. And you mentioned the Kardashians earlier. You know, uh, Robert was like his biggest fan. I mean, he's yeah. the one who gives the, uh, you know, he's answering during the Bronco thing. He's making press conferences. He's speaking on OJ's behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But then what was interesting was in that uh, the Ryan Murphy uh, uh, telling that uh, series, uh, he he almost feels like he like his friend is lying. He's like very hes. You get the feeling like he's hesitant, but because he's known him for so long, and you know they're really close just, friends. Uh, yeah, you know. So he then, wants, which you know, makes sense why you say it's like he was involved. We just don't know how. And did he kill her, or was he just there? So yeah. was he like an accomplice versus the actual perpetrator? But then, as you said, he's guilty of something. Guilty of something. Um, but who actually killed them? I mean, you, you definitely like. I'm I'm not 100 percent sure now, so that that's definitely. I just think there were too many. Again, I didn't. I had always heard, you know, like tinfoil hat people, you know, like conspiracy buffs, be like, ah, oh. and I was like, yeah, maybe, you know, it was to me like at the beginning of the Murdoch trial, I was like, maybe Buster helped, or maybe Buster had something to do with it. You know, I always, you know. I like to give the benefit of a doubt, especially when they just zero in on one suspect. Yeah. But it's tough because he's a perfect suspect. Yeah. But could but the question then lies in could he have done it alone? You know, right. there are right. there were other footprints at the scene. There were other drops of DNA on the That's back of Nicole. Hard. On the back of Nicole, there are blood drops that they never analyzed. So someone's standing over her, but that blood was never. Right, right. They, just, they really messed a lot of things up. Yeah, I feel. So the, yeah. So it was the uh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense that they. Well, yeah. I I don't understand why they wouldn't have, uh, scoured that crime scene for every blood drops. But as you said, that there have been, um, with like tampering, and the yeah. EM, EMD and the blood. I mean, there's definitely like, creates doubt. Yeah, but the problem doubt. is, and, yeah. No, no, you're good. Well, I was going to say, and then the LAPD corruption. I mean, the 80s and the 90s were horrifying for the LAPD. So, um, all right. So it makes yeah. you wonder, did the black jury members just hear all this stuff? And once they heard police tampering, they were just like, you know what? Like, You're nah. not going to do this. You're not going to no, do this to exactly. uh, yeah, our hero, because you know. he was a hero of the community. He was a hero. He made the crossover. So, you know, he yeah. made the, he brought whites and blacks. He was loved by everyone, which is in that amazing, uh, uh, OJ in America, I believe, is that documentary, which is just incredible to see the rise and then the fall. Um, but yeah, I just think with a case like this, there are just too many uh, holes that it's... It's an option. It's, and it's, it's, it kills them. Yeah, I mean, you don't write... The, my whole thing is <laughs> you don't write a book called If I Did It, and you don't hold up a sports memorabilia store at gunpoint with people in Vegas. Right. Exactly. I mean, there's some, obviously something going on and there's he is a wife abuser. So like there's already yeah. the propensity for violence is awful. And where yeah. were the kids in all of this? Like, were they watching their mother being like beaten the shit out? Of, like, so there's a lot of like very, very horrifying, problematic, yeah. like, which is why as a woman, I'm like, he probably did it. But when you actually go look for the truth, the truth is murkier because of the circumstances surrounding with like the police corruption, right. the the weird evidence, the never talking to everybody, um, Jason and the knives. I mean, that is actually, again, as a crime writer, I'm like, well, that's his MO. Knives He's using his knives. Thing. Whereas, yeah. again, if she had been strangled, they're like, oh, yeah, that, that was totally OJ. Um, right. So definitely a fascinating case and oh my God, an avalanche of uh, information. So uh, hopefully we got it yeah. somewhere, you know, I mean, you, within I mean, the realm the mafia, of- Even the mafia angle I thought was interesting, but to me, it just, that seemed more, it, it just doesn't, doesn't, you know, I think there are two, it's, 
It didn't make sense. I understand. I, I do believe that this Charlie Ulrich was their drug dealer. I completely yeah. believe that he was whole a part of this whole scene. But I don't think it was like, let's go intimidate her. And like, OJ is like, oh my right. God, what are you guys doing? Like this whole thing. Right. I really do. Right. I, right. What makes sense to me is like, he didn't like Nicole. And his son called him and said, you won't be- I can't believe I just did this, dad. I need your help. And then he was cool with it. Yeah, he's like, okay, well, I got to help my I'm son. I'm not going to do it. My son just did it. Yeah. 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 So um, so Who that knows? was the case of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. And was it OJ Simpson? Was it his son? Was it the mafia? Was it somebody else? Please don't, please don't come after us. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, please. We're, it's just we're just uh we're just, just putting out some here. crazy theories you know something serious <laughs> um, However, but we anyway were dead so, on about murdoch we were dead on we were we were i'm telling you that four minutes you can't yes. go get away from a crime scene in four minutes yeah. on a golf cart that because of a chicken two, that and two midget assassins knew that they had guns that they could just use <laughs> exactly it's like dude but you're you're just done oh god anyway so <laughs> happily he will be in jail for the rest of his life yeah. and oj simpson where is oj now he's has he like he's like on twitter and instagram I, it's oh is he really <laughs> he it's, he's like it's as though nothing he's happened just like nothing happened he's his his image well because he was acquitted right so right so he's he playing acquitted. with that you know yeah. As soon as he got out yeah. of jail, he was like, it's on. Like, you know, he still has the money to pay. So he's right. to pay yeah. this, so he's, the, you the know, Coleman he's, stuff. Yeah, he's which I feel is why he held up the Las Vegas store. I feel he was like, oh, my God, I need money. I'm going to I got it. I was found guilty in that. I got to get my memorabilia back. Was it because wasn't yeah. he trying to steal back his own memorabilia? Correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh. Oh my goodness! Um, oof, but so he's still around. Is... We don't know where Jason is. Uh, it really is sad uh, that that these victims uh, perish this way. It's just brutal. The murder, oh, just brutal. you know, on and on. It's just. Whew. Yeah, it's exactly. It is hard. So, I. Stay tuned for what case we'll do next week. We're not sure. I think we're going to maybe stay away from these very popular trial case, do something a little different. Stay tuned. We'll let you know. Otherwise, thank you for joining us. And uh, we do have an Instagram. So let us know who you think did it. Um, I will be posting more. We're still just starting up and going. So things are in flux, but hopefully we'll uh, make things smoother. And so you can find us on Instagram and have a great week. And thank you for listening. This episode was sponsored by The Creek Killer, book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks, like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. Until next time.